Karen, Donna, go. Yes, sir. We're ready. Thank you. Okay. Are our participants all live and, and plugged in with us? Yes, okay. sir. We have 230 people here with you watching. Great, great. Well, uh, good morning. I'm Lance Bolton. Uh, most of you know that. I'm uh, just, just starting my 10th year here at Pike Speak Community College and was uh, not expecting uh, the beginning we have today. But uh, much has changed in our world. I'm going to go through our PDW address as I always have, but of course, this will be our first and I'm certainly for our last uh, virtual version of this. I very, very much miss being with, with you all, being with people, the energy of the, the beginning of the school year of us all together. But this is where we are today. So um, with that, I'm, I'm going to share my screen and get our PDW uh, presentation up and we'll get started. Okay. All right. Well, as uh, I think everybody has experienced, virtual meetings have present their own set of challenges, and we're still working through these. Well, some of us have gotten pretty good at Teams meetings, but this is, uh, I think, my first time hosting a large uh, event on uh, WebEx. And so, anyway, um, as I said, we're, we are, um, I'm really glad you're here and uh, I do really miss us being together in person. And um, I wanna start and uh, uh, you'll, you'll see, I'm actually starting and ending the presentation with this because it's so important to me. Uh, we, we as an institution and you all uh, have just done an incredible job this, this spring and across the summer of responding to just extraordinary chaos, to extraordinary change. You know, the changes that we implemented during spring semester, in any normal time, if we were going to make the, the level and the type of changes that we made, it would have probably taken us a couple of years and a whole lot of committees and task forces, and, and we just did it, and we did it really fast. And, and we did it really well. And I'll share some data with you that, that actually shows how well we did it. But um, across the institution, my, my overwhelming sense about all this has been gratitude uh, to the college and to people who have made, I, I don't think it's overstating it to say, have made heroic efforts in terms of responding to the challenges and making sure that we took care of students and, and the college's mission from facilities to custodians, our IT group and IT and CETL, a lot of hard work has gone into to making this morning work well, and thank you for that as well. Uh, the finance team and the, the enormous complexity of dealing with CARES Act money and how that would work. E-learning stepped up and supported so many different faculty members in so many different ways. Student services, advising, testing, enrollment, financial aid have done incredible work in preparing us and, and supporting students through this, this in, incredibly challenging process. Learning Commons and of course faculty and uh, faculty the, the work of transitioning every class to online learning last spring semester. And again, I'll share some data with you about how spring semester came out for our students. Just an extraordinary job. And so uh, overwhelming sense of gratitude and thankfulness for the work done. I don't need to tell you all, you, you certainly know, we're, we're living in extraordinary times. And I, I guess it will take historians to help us put this in perspective and find exactly what kind of times we were living in. And maybe every generation or, or every 
you know, so many years, we, we feel like that we're in pivotal moments and, and moments of, of uh, significant and permanent and lasting change. And I think that that's happening now. Uh, I think we're living in really extraordinary times right now. And, and of course, layered um, layered issues and layered challenges. So, so, of course, the coronavirus and the pandemic and how we're responding to that and all of the many, many, many ways that it impacts our lives. I was unable to think of anything that the coronavirus has not in some way impacted in terms of how, how I live and how I work. And I expect that's true for everyone. And some of it's, it's, it's been a, an inconvenience and, and created anxiety and concerns and challenges for others. It's been really devastating with lost work and lost jobs or or illness and lost family members and so so the way people are experiencing the coronavirus is, is vastly different across the college and across our society i would say but we're all being impacted in, in profound ways and then of course layered on top of that is the the murder of george floyd and and the, the incredible outrage and, and protests and voices that have risen up and new leaders rising up around that and, and a civil rights movement with the energy and the, the, the same focus that, that maybe hasn't been seen in our country since the 1950s. And so, so these things layered on top of one another and of course they're connected. One of the things that, that we know about the pandemic is that it has disproportionately affected communities of color. And I sit on the, the Colorado Springs Recovery Council, and every week I get to meet with the leadership of El Paso County Public Health Department, and, and we look at the data, and I can tell you that data is true for El Paso County, and I think it's true for the whole nation. So we're living in, in really chaotic, profound, and, and changing times, and, and times that I think will have an impact on our lives for decades to come as we, we come through this. And, and in the midst of all that, we have the challenge of carrying forward with our mission at Pikes Peak. And so, so I'm going to try to provide some vision and thoughts about that. We'll look back at our data and uh, I'll look forward at what we think this year will hold. I always uh, try to provide, for purposes of transparency, a look at the same data every year, year after year at the college, looking at it in the same way. So if you're new to this, this um, my PDW presentation, uh, one of the things that I care really deeply about is, is providing really transparent information and, and being really uh, straight and clear with the college about what we're doing and how we're doing it. So by providing the same information in the same format, in the same way, year after year. I think it allows us to do that. So I'm not cherry picking what I think is the data that looks good for us. I'm just giving you, giving you what it is. And, and with that comment, I do want to say too that, that my purpose here is really to inform the college and to, to set forth a vision for what we think that the institution, our institutional mission will look like this year and how we'll achieve it but also to answer your questions and to inform you well. And so if you want to jump into the, the chat at any time, we, we've got folks monitoring that and you can put in questions there. Uh, if, it, if we can fit them in, we'll just stop and do some questions along the way, or we may just collect them all at the end, depending on how many questions are coming in. I really would love to have your participation in, in this 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 process, one of the, the small wins I've seen in sort of digital meetings like this is we actually get more participation sometimes. I, I know it can be hard to stand up in the theater with several hundred people there and raise your hand and ask a question, but maybe it's a little bit easier to, to just plug a question into the chat. So feel free to do that. I really want to answer your questions and address your concerns. Well, and I'll start, as I always do, with enrollment and where we are. And uh, it, I wouldn't have imagined that I would be thrilled with these numbers this morning, but I really am because we've made a lot of progress over the last couple of weeks. So um, summer semester, I want to remind you, we started out 25, 30% down early in the enrollment process. 
And we ended up tightening that up and we ended up summer semester, we were down about 3.4%. Uh, fall semester, when we opened enrollment in, in early on in uh, March, April, May, we were down as much as about 35% year over year. And, uh, and just in the last two weeks, though, we've gone from being down 25% to this morning, we're down only 16.4%. So to me, this feels like a huge win. And, uh, and we're really, really glad to see enrollment coming back because certainly it impacts our budget. And, but it's not just our budget. It's also about the people we serve. So. Just since Monday, since uh, Friday of last week, we've gone from being down over 18%. Today, we're down just 16%. And would never would have imagined the world where we're a week away from classes starting. And we're down in Rome by 16%. And I'm cheering that, but I'm cheering it this morning. And uh, just a quick reminder, I'll probably touch on this again later, but we budgeted to be down 15% in enrollment for fall semester and 5% for spring. So if we do better than the 15%, and I think we will, uh, we're going to be in good shape in terms of what our, our budget looks like and being able to, to meet the fiscal responsibilities of the college. What I'm concerned about when I think about being down 16.4%, though, is, is really what that means for our students. So I'll give you some context, I think, system-wide. Uh, Last data I saw, we were we were trending about two or three percent worse than the system average. So I think the system average was about sixteen percent last week, and at that time we were down about eighteen percent. I think one of the reasons that we're doing just slightly worse in terms of enrollment than the rest of the system is that uh, while active duty military are are holding their own and, and really even this year compared to last year. We've seen a dramatic drop in veterans using their GI Bill benefits to attend. And I think one of their challenges is that they have a certain number of months that they have available to them to be in school and have their school paid for. So some, I think, are, are wisely being cautious about, do I want to jump in this semester? And, and until they hear a really reassuring message from us that we got you and we've got a good plan and we're going to get people through this, I think that they're being cautious and I think we can take heart that we can take care of them and that, that they can be successful based on what we were able to accomplish with our students during spring semester. So the other group that, I, that we're really down in and everybody is down in, but the, you know, the military and uh, the veteran GI Bill benefits is of course disproportionately impacting Pikes Peak because that's so many of our students compared to the other colleges in the system. But we're all really down to and new first time students The new first time students are primarily not all not exclusively, but, but a large group of that is new high school graduates. And I'm really concerned about those students not choosing higher education right now. And when I'm talking to young people about this, what I would say is that, that if you defer going to, to college right now, you might never go to college. And we've seen this in the past with other recessions and other challenging times where years of students decided not to go to college at the same rates and they never caught up. Some of those students just never end up going to college. So, so while it might be wise to take fewer classes because they'll be remote and, and that might be a different format that could be more challenging for students, I think the choice to sit out entirely is a choice that does not serve young people in our community well. And so, one of the things that we see with this too is that lower income and communities of color have been enrolling at lower levels as well. And so that's really concerning for us because we, of course we need all people in our community to do well and to thrive. Well, we, we've got a little celebrating we can do here. I believe uh, fall of 2019, looking at this graphic was our eighth consecutive year of increased retention rates. And I intend to celebrate this and publicize it all, all I can this year because uh, year 10 uh, this fall might, might be challenging. I don't, I don't know if we'll be able to, to maintain this uh, in the environment of, of the pandemic and how it's impacting higher ed. But if you look at this graphic, this is really quite remarkable achievement on the part of the college 
2011, we were at 47% fall fall retention rate. And uh, 2019, we were at 56.9. I'm just going to call that 57. And almost a 10, 10% increase in retention rate over those eight years. And what's really remarkable about this, and when I look at the data uh, from other institutions and how folks work, it, it can be relatively easy and doable to put a lot of resources into a particular effort and get a little boost for a year or two. And then typically what you see is institutions go back down to a sort of steady state and then they, they might boost up again uh, with another big effort in a, in a year or two. And, and what we see here is that we're making gains in sustaining them and we're making gains in sustaining them. And I think that is on behalf of this college, just a remarkable achievement for Pikes Peak. And so um, when I think about this, I think about all the things that, and all the ways that we've been able to impact students. You know, there's the learning commons and big increases we've seen over the last few years in the amount of tutoring that students get. There are relationships built on the student services side. And very importantly, there's what goes on in our classrooms. It really impacts retention, I think. High impact practices that have brought more engaged learning to students. The equity project, which really looked at how do we impact students of color in the classroom and in particular in math classes, but we're expanding out from that now. So, so those kinds of efforts and projects around student equity and engagement in the classroom, the work that CEDL has done in training faculty and put, putting out information and, and guidance and bringing in inspirational speakers and helping us connect to this vision have all really made a difference over these last eight years and now nine years. And so I'm really proud of our institution for these changes and, and you should you should stand up and celebrate. We can do a, 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 a virtual wave around the community of yay and another year of increased retention rates, which over these years has amounted to thousands of students staying in campus, staying in college and ultimately graduating. Behind this really wonderful and, and rosy retention data are some more challenging numbers. And so as we've gotten better and better at disaggregating our data, and I want to tip my hat to Keith Barnes and, and his, his um, relentless voice to saying disaggregate the data, disaggregate the data. One of the things that we see is we see big differences between our white students retention rate of 58.4%. Black males, 49.5%. So almost a 10% difference there. And, and that, that's one of the things that, that you'll see as we go along in this presentation is that, that really, really great numbers for the college overall may often mask numbers that aren't so great for some groups. And so, so we're going to be taking on this challenge in the coming year. And I'm going to say more about this, but we see this retention data play out in our graduation numbers as well. So last year was our first year ever of eclipsing 4,000 degrees in certificates. We were down, but only slightly this, this past spring. And we may add a few more students to this graduation number as students clear up and finish their incompletes. But right now, we're at 3,881 graduates. That's a four-year graduation rate of 28.2%. Our goal as an institution is 25%, and so I feel like we're doing really well there. I will remind you as you think about those numbers that a student who accumulates, for example, 40 credit hours at Pikes Peak and transfers to UCCS, as many, many students do, that student doesn't count in our graduation numbers. A student who comes to Pikes Peak and, and just wants to learn a skill, let's say they, were, they need to learn a particular welding skill for a a promotion in, in their workplace. That student doesn't count in our graduation numbers. So there are lots of reasons that our graduation numbers are what they are because we serve a very diverse community with very diverse needs and, and very diverse goals as they come into college. Nevertheless, the graduation numbers and, and percentages are important. And so again, when we disaggregate this, this data that looks great, what we see is really big differences here. So graduation rate of 30, over 30% 30 for our white students. When we look at African-American males, 7.1%. That's unacceptable, 7.1%. So, so although 
we know that, that there are lots of reasons our graduation numbers are what they are. What we what we should expect to see here and what is reasonable to think is that all students could perform at the same level, that, that there would be graduation rates for African American males that look the same as graduation rates for any other group. And when there's not, and when there is this big of a gap, there's a challenge for us to, to overcome and to, to meet here. I, I look at this data and I I see really unacceptable levels of graduation rates for our African American students in particular. And I see that the institution must respond to that. That the, the days of uh, thinking, for example, that all students have a right to fail is really outdated thinking uh, and is no longer where we are. When we recognize that all students enter our institution on average with the same intellectual capability to be successful, and yet we see outcomes that are just very different. There are things that are happening in our institution that contribute to that that we can work on. And the, the equity project and the partnership that we have with the Center for Urban Education made clear with real data over time and working directly with faculty in their classrooms and their practices, we can in fact make a significant difference here. This is not an intractable problem, it's a solvable problem and we're gonna get after it this year. I think we can really make a difference. Always, we, we talked about college reserves at the, the beginning of the year and it's in particular important this year because we're relying on reserves for some of our operational revenues. So just a reminder that, that our practice and policy is that locally at Pikes Peak Community College, we've set forth the goal of maintaining reserves at at least 25%. And uh, the system office, uh, our state board, requires us to maintain reserves at at least 6%. So we've spent down our reserves over the last couple of years for some, some major capital projects. Uh, we saved money and then, then we started spending it and entirely appropriate in the way that this is gone. So we bought for a little over $5 million the land and the building where our medical campus is. And uh, we made significant investments in, in renovating that building for the first phase of our Center for Healthcare Education and Simulation. And we've also done a big renovation of the uh, Studio West, with which is the building that is directly west of our downtown studio campus. Beautiful job on that building. So we've, we've spent down our reserves some, but we're still in a really good position. And this is really important to us that we're in a good position right now. Our budget for the coming year includes spending $2 million of reserves just to cover our operating budget. And the reason we're doing that, and what's really important about that for us is that we need to, and I believe our first priority as a college should be to protect our people, to take care of our staff, to take care of our team. Here's what I think is going to happen and how this may play out over the next year or two. Right now, we're seeing a big decline in enrollment. That means a big decline in revenue for the college. So we're pulling in some savings to take care of our staff and to take care of our team and to hold on to our team because I think enrollment is going to come back. If you look at the Great Recession, which really started in earnest in late 2007, 2008, it took 18 months into the recession before community college enrollment across the state and nation started to really grow. And the, the enrollment in community colleges continued to grow until well after the recession was declared over. And so I think there's a lag time with, with what's happening. Right now, we're seeing the declining enrollments, but a year from now, we may see significantly increased enrollments. And so the experienced people, the, the, the talented people, the passionate people that make up our Pikes Peak Community College team, we need you and we need to, to take care of you because enrollment is going to come back. I really believe it will. And it may come back in a really big way as unemployment benefits are, are exhausted. And right now, people are holding off on making decisions about college because maybe they don't know what their kids' school is going to look like. And are they going to be homeschooling two kids at home? And, and could they still manage college then? But it will come back. And when it comes back, we need our team here. 
And so that's how we use our reserves. We use our reserves to, to preserve the great team we have at Pikes Peak. We've got all of our capital projects on hold right now, and we're really focused on just taking care of our team. A quick update from the foundation. They would like you to know and to celebrate with them that they awarded more than 455 scholarships. That was 100 more than last year and a record $1.3 million of scholarship funding went out of our foundation to Pikes Peak Community College students, a 28% increase in the number of students served. And we're really proud of that and, and grateful to Lisa and Jessica and Sarah, the great job that the foundation has done. If you look at your screen, it has some of our current uh, foundation board members there. Uh, middle left is Tyson Dunn, who is our current board chair, and middle right is Shirley Stewart, and Shirley is our un incoming board chair. And so uh, that board is just doing a terrific, fantastic job in supporting our college and our mission, and most importantly, our students. Well, I'm going to shift gears here. I'm going to look back a little bit at spring semester, in particular at what the what the data tells us about how we did in spring semester, and then we'll take a look forward at what we think this year will be. Well, of all the things that I'm proud of in this, this presentation today about Pike Speak and our performance, none more than than what's on your screen in front of you. If you take a look at the, the first row, passing grades uh, from spring semester 2019 compared to spring 2020, 77% of uh, courses, classes that students took, students received a passing grade in 2019. That number was 75% at the end of term for 2020 and 76% as of August 7th. And of course, what's happening here is that incompletes are being completed and students are converting incompletes to passing grades. You can see that this story play out perhaps even more clearly with failing grades. So if you look at failing grades, in the term 16% for 2019, 15% in the term 2020. Oh, I'm not sure why this is 85% failing grades as of August 7th, but that's not correct. It's still just 15%. So 15% of, of all grades issued in spring semester uh, resulted in a failing grade for students. One percentage point less in 2020 than in 2019, which I think is quite remarkable. Withdrawals in 2019 spring semester, 6.8%. In 2020 spring semester, 7.6%, less than 1% increase in withdrawals. And finally, incompletes is where we see probably the biggest change. 0.2% incompletes uh, grades in 2019. That up, went up to 2.1 in 2020, but already half of those have been cleared. And so students are clearing those, those incompletes, able to graduate, able to get a passing grade and move forward with their classes. You know, when, when this was all happening back in uh, the, the pandemic was breaking out and there was this sort of chaos everywhere, and we went on the two week spring break and decided we were going to convert all classes to online instruction. The, the job done with that and the job done in nurturing our students and bringing them along, it's just absolutely incredible. I, I cannot believe how well we did. We, we thought that we would have huge numbers of withdrawals and incompletes. And we, we were contemplating all sorts of strategies and, and building out strategies to have and hire faculty just to help students complete their incompletes. And, and we thought we might have thousands and thousands of withdrawals and, and we didn't. And the fact that we didn't is really a testament to the good work that this college has done. Our faculty have done an incredible job but coming alongside faculty as we came out of the, the two week spring break, a lot of students were not re-engaging. And so a team of folks, uh, our, our diversity, equity and inclusion team got engaged here. Folks from student services got engaged here. And we started making calls, thousands of calls out to students to say, hey, get with it, get back in here. We, we got you, you can complete, you can be successful, you can do this. And, uh, and we got computers out folks and, and IT did a great job of, of getting those prepared and sent out to students and students responded 
and they were by and large successful. Not, no drop really in student success in spring 2020 compared to spring 2019. And I think that's just a remarkable achievement given the chaos that we were involved in. So we surveyed students and we asked them how we did. And, and we had good response to this survey. I don't remember the percentage, but 53% of students surveyed said that we were either highly successful or very highly successful in doing the transition in spring semester to online learning. Only 8% of students said that we were not successful at doing this. And I would imagine that, that we would get that 8% of students saying we weren't doing a good job in any, any semester because they may have been struggling themselves with what was happening. But uh, students really responded incredibly positively. So this, this was a five point survey. So 92% of students, I think, gave us a passing grade for how we did. Uh, some of their suggestions were communicate better. And that was a really challenging suggestion and we tried to dig into it. For some, communicate better meant more communication. For some, it meant less communication. For some, it meant specific communication about a class. For others, it meant broader communication from uh, the institution. So we're still trying to sort that out and figure out how to do that better for students. Uh, not surprisingly, suggestions to reduce homework, uh, better guidance and instruction. I think so, some of us, some, some faculty are very experienced in online instruction, others new to that environment. So of course, there were some challenges, but I think in general, we did incredibly well. More live video and recordings. I did note that, that I got better responses uh, to videos I put out to students than to long detailed emails. So I was, I was doing a fair amount of those as well and clear guidelines for assignments. Uh, CARES Act funding is also part of our, our look back and how spring semester went. And I want to talk a little bit about CARES Act funding because it's having a huge impact on our college and how we operate. So I'm going to introduce uh, what might be a new word for you, and, and it is the word tranche, uh, T-R-A-U-N-C-H. That's the American spelling, although I think it's more of a British word, and our chief budget officer, um, Hugh Bradford, often uses the, the British spelling, and so we've chuckled about our different spellings of this. But a tranche of funds is a, a group of uh, is, is, is funds received at one time for some purpose. And so initially when the CARES Act was passed, we got about seven and a half million, a little over seven and a half million dollars at Pikes Peak Community College, easily the largest uh, fund recipient within the community college system because it was based on both size and Pell Grant um, eligibility. So we have a lot more Pell students than Front Range Community College, although they're larger. So we were actually received the largest CARES Act funding of any colleges in the system. It came in two tranches. So the first was uh, that arrived initially was $3.75 million to assist students directly. Now I'll talk, about, I'll talk a little bit about that in just a minute and how that worked and, and how it continues to work for us. Uh, a, a few weeks later, we received a second tranche and this was 3.75 million specifically to assist our institution. Later, there was additional funding that happened. And this is a little bit more complicated than how I'm going to present it, but the, the, the state legislature and the governor were in ongoing negotiations last spring to figure out the budget for the state. And we were, we were a bit surprised uh, late in that process when uh, the, the process changed from what it looked like it was going to be, and they made a huge cut to higher ed. They cut 54% of the higher ed budget for this year. And we have never seen a cut like that in higher ed, I think in the, the history of our state. So 54% of our budget was cut, and then they allocated CARES Act funding to the, the higher ed to try to make up for that. They, they have specifically said that we are not backfilling and we are not backfilling the money, although that's kind of what it looks like. So, so it's actually a little bit hard to talk about because the, the obvious terms are we're, we're told are not applicable here. But most of what was cut 
and the 54% cut to higher ed budget was restored through CARES Act funding. And so, so that money is really just being used by the institution for you know, the, the operating costs of our institution. Different than the two $3.75 million uh, sets of money that are very specific in how they can be used. So CARES Act funding for students, um, very frustrating to me how this went. And I've provided feedback directly in conversations to uh, senators uh, Corey Gardner and Michael Bennett, uh, U.S. Senators for Colorado, who have inquired with higher ed how things are going. And we said the way this was done uh, was really problematic for our institutions because here's what they did. Folks in Washington decided that these funds could only be used to, to support students who were on campus students on March 13th. And, and no one else has access to these funds. So if you were taking uh, PPCC online classes spring semester, you were un ineligible to receive these funds. If you had already dropped your classes because of the pandemic and the chaos before March 13th, you were ineligible to receive these funds. Uh, initially, we had thought and we had built plans to try to use some of the funds to provide funding support to newly unemployed people to come back to college to skill up and get back into the economy. We were told we could not do that. We can only use the funds for students who were taking classes on campus as of March 13th. And that's really important because we've got a lot of money available here. Emergency grants for students, we awarded $51,000 to through emergency grants to students during summer semester. I'm sorry, we awarded 48,000. We, we actually paid out 48,000. Sometimes there are awards that are not accepted by students. But we allocated $400,000 for emergency grants. So as you're talking to students about their situation, if you care about students in challenging situations, we have emergency grant funding available. We've, We've already awarded 69,000 for fall semester, but we still have almost $300,000 available. And these emergency grants are to help with things like food, utilities, rent, child care. That students can apply and receive funds for those. They apply through our financial aid office and, and the funds can be made available quite quickly. But to be eligible, if you're talking to a student who says, I'm experiencing challenges and, and I really need help. I, I can't pay my rent or we need food help. These funds are only available for those students who are enrolled taking on-campus classes as of March 13th. And people, students have said to me, this is unfair. And I say, I agree, it's unfair. This is not well-crafted emergency aid. And I really wish that folks in Washington would have trusted the colleges around the nation to use the money to support our communities and support, to support our mission instead of deciding this level of detail for us. So in addition to the emergency grants, we're also doing momentum scholarships. So again, any student who is enrolled in on-campus on classes on March 13th is eligible for these. There are $1,000 awards and we have uh, in summer semester we paid out almost a million dollars in momentum scholarships and we've awarded almost three million for fall of course we award uh, what we award isn't always what we pay because some people decide not to attend but we'll use up our cares act funding for students through emergency grants and momentum scholarships oh i should mention too i wanted to mention that, that computers we were able to use cares act funds to buy computers as well as the foundation was able to obtain resources for computers as well. So we have over 250 computers that are available and going out to students as loaners. And we have retired computers, about 300, that will come become available over the course of the year here at Pikes Peak. We'll also put out to students and make available. And so so we're we are responding to, and I think thus far have been able to fully meet the need of students requesting uh, computers to be able to work from home. 
here's that funding for the institution. Here's some of the things that we've spent money on, plexiglass and other barriers, uh, PPE, so that's masks, primarily some gloves, but we're buying a lot of masks and trying to make sure that we're well stocked to, to support faculty and staff and students in the coming year. We're not gonna be giving everybody masks every day, but if people forget them, we're gonna have them available for folks. Uh, we've spent money on signage. We've spent money on uh, additional custodial support staff, online student services support. So people in new positions there and, and uh, supporting students strictly online. High flex technology for classrooms that allow us to broadcast uh, courses with both live students in the classroom, people live remote, as well as being able to, to record those and watch them later. CDC teachers, we've been, we needed to add CDC teachers to be able to support our children in the, the child development centers and online orientation are just some of the things that we've spent CARES Act funding on to support the institution. I wanted to mention too that uh, I'm really proud of the institution and, and student life and our, our uh, support folks from HIPS as well for the PPCC's curbside pantry. So, you know, we have a very robust uh, food support program here at Pikes Peak that we've operated for a couple of years. We've given out literally hundreds of tons of food to students over the last couple of years. And we, we were shut down with the pantry at the beginning stages of the, the pandemic. But uh, thanks to our staff, we, we got this back up and running and we found a really great solution so students can contact Student Life, they can, can request food support, and we can deliver it to them curbside in the safest way possible. So since we started this back in May, 726 households have received support, 21,000 food items have been sent out. And so, so we're continuing to support the pantry and the food needs of our Pikes Peak community. I want to just run through some kudos and, and uh, advising and testing 39,000 interactions between April and July. Students are needing more help in this environment to try to sort out what their needs are. Um, every situation is different. Students' personal health issues are part of it. Will the class be online or will it be in person? Uh, so many issues that students need support in, in sorting out. And so this has created just tremendous additional burden for advising and testing. And they've really stepped up and done a great job. And, and I should note enrollment and financial aid here as well. I know financial aid has awarded, in spite of the fact that we're down in enrollment, they've awarded almost 10% more Pell Grants than we did in the previous year. Um, almost 10,000. Uh, text messages we've responded to from students back to us uh, since we started fall enrollment processes. Hundreds of thousands of emails. Um, I, I think almost 10,000 outbound calls to student prospects from our enrollment team. So just an enormous level of work from those teams trying to support the institution and supporting students as they try to figure out, can I come back to college and how is this going to work? The, the, the people really carrying the load with helping students sort that out and make their decisions and get back into school is our folks from Student Services, and they're doing a great job. Uh, kudos to, to Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. I want to note a HEAT Award. This is our third year of receiving the Higher, Ex, Higher Education Excellence and Diversity Award. The bar is very high for this, and and you can't just say you did what you did last year. Every year you have to show that you're moving forward as an institution and improving. And I know that he doesn't like for me to call him out on this, but um, Keith Barnes would say this is a, a, an effort across the college and he's right about that, but the effort needs a leader and he's been a great leader on this. And so Keith, thanks for your good work in guiding the college and helping us achieve this recognition for the third consecutive year. And I also want to note the work of our diversity, equity, inclusion team around virtual communities, because I think what they're doing applies broadly to the whole college. So they're trying to set up virtual communities 
for things like United Men of Color and make sure that students have a connection point. And I'm really concerned, deeply concerned about what the student experience will be in the coming year. If going to college means going down to the basement and sitting in front of a computer, it is understandable that many students may not feel and experience a sense of belonging, a sense of connectedness to Pikes Peak. And so one of the ways that we can fight that in combat, it's not perfect, but it's better, much better than nothing, is through virtual communities and setting up opportunities for people to get together. One of the things that, that we do, uh, myself and, and the staff that reports directly to me at the college, we have a staff meeting every Thursday morning, and uh, we always have way more on the agenda than we can really get to and, and make decisions about and work through every week. But in spite of that, we try to take a few minutes at the beginning of the meeting every week to just connect with each other, to, to hear about people's gardens or what, what, what weekend adventures they've had or have planned or, or how their kids are doing in, in schools and, and what they're, they're experiencing around the homeschooling their own children. And so, so I think that that human connection part is really important. So whether it is your department getting together for creating virtual communities and having time to chat and connect and just be human with each other, or if it's students in a class, I really encourage you to reach out and, and look for ways to set up these virtual communities. And, and our crack team and IT and e-learning can help you with the technology challenges, put these together and they're, they're really important for us to have meaningful connection with each other. So, so in this coronavirus time, often virtual communities are the best that we can do. A, a huge kudos, um, again, uh, another big win for our college was our virtual commencement. And I hope you all have seen that. I think it's still available out there. We, we will be sending out some uh, video clips, including a highlight reel uh, video clip from our virtual commencement uh, right after this presentation. The presentation really is too long to, to embed these videos in, but you'll get them later and you can check them out. Uh, I, I, we, we have a history faculty member here, Kathy Sturdivant, who told me she was collecting things about the pandemic for historical preservation and purposes. And I thought that was really wonderful. And th this is a great example of, 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 I think, a historical document, this virtual commencement. We'd never done it before. It's not what students, faculty, or staff wanted. We all wanted to be together to celebrate as we always do in purpose, uh, and, and as we always do in, in in the past. And yet, I think that the virtual commencement really captured the moment, and captured the emotion, and, and did a great job of, of providing both the recognition and recognizing the time that we were in. And so big kudos go to, to student life, to communications and marketing, and uh, Kerrigan Edelman, who helped to organize all of this and make it happen. So job well done there in recognizing our students. Virtual dance performances are an example of how classes have been able to use technology to move forward and keep going in this pandemic time. I know music and voice classes are also using virtual performance technology, and we can use technology to capture our work together and to move forward. So again, if you need help with technology, I encourage you to reach out. We can do these things and we can make them meaningful for students. And I think that's really important for us. Virtual town hall recruitment events have also been a big success. We've done a few of these. We'll tend to have a lot of people that are live with us. So typically we'll have around 100 people who will connect during the virtual town hall. But afterwards, people also watch these. And we've had over 17,000 people view these events afterwards. And I think they're getting their questions answered. And we're, we're really trying to hit the questions head on, to hear what students are concerned about, and to respond to them. And these have been very well done and very well viewed. We also have been doing uh, Tuesday afternoon at 2 o'clock Facebook Live events. I've done a couple of these. I know Dr. Baker has done some of these. I think Dr. Wesley, most recently, the bookstore hosted. And uh, I know communications and marketing did one about, about what our fall marketing plan looked like. 
And so these have been opportunities for people to connect in from the college community and hear about specifically about what's going on in different areas. And, and I think they've also been a big success in terms of just helping us stay connected with one another. Uh, this was a wonderful win and in a really innovative way to use our campus to create community. So Student Life put together a drive-in movie night. It sold out almost immediately and about 450 students and their families were able to go to the Rampart campus and watch a movie together. I was really proud of us for being able to provide something like this to our community. So a big shout out to Student Life for a job well done. Open educational resources. Pikes Peak Community College is really leading the state in OER work, and we're just doing a great job. We have 28 courses now. That's not classes, that's just courses. And so, so they span the whole spectrum of, our, of what we do. We have business courses, we have English courses, we have geology courses. So, so every division is involved right now in open educational resources and providing online resources instead of textbooks that, that are expensive for our students. This past year, we saved students about $2.3 million. Now, I'll say the, the impact of this is our bookstore is getting clobbered in terms of their revenues, and bookstore revenue for years has helped to, to support other things at the college, notably uh, under, underwriting, kind of uh, providing funding for the Child Development Center, and so we're going to need to look for other resources for our Child Development Center. But this is the right thing to do. Even though we're getting really hit in terms of bookstore revenue, we're saving our students literally millions of dollars a year now through open educational resources. And, and again, Pikes Peak really is a leader. We were heavily featured in a, a recent video that the Community College System Office put together about OER. And Pikes Peak was, was really sort of the shining star in that. And so across the college to all departments involved in OER, thank you for your good work. You are really helping students and making college affordable and accessible. Studio West is uh, done and we did really a beautiful job in there. I have a shout out and big kudos to faculty and uh, people like uh, Stephanie Kovas and, and Sarah Shaver to Fran Hetrick and Sharon Hogue and others who helped create the vision for what this would be, as well as the architects who took their, their input and built this out. And it is a beautiful space and it is empty uh, because we were not able to move in because of the pandemic. But um, as we're able, we will do an open house to the new Studio West, and you will see this is really an incredible space. So the, the art gallery is in the front, and then there's dance studio and a black box theater beyond that. Upstairs, there's kind of a cafe space for students as well as classroom and office. Really proud of what we got done here, and it's going to serve students well when we can be back in there. Also, you will note that the front of Studio West has a, a interesting uh, mural painted on it and uh, really beautiful and colorful and uh, part of Downtown Partnerships Art on the Streets project. And Downtown Partnership paid for this mural to go onto our building and, and we're, we're gonna get some attention for this. People are gonna come by and say, wow, what is going on there? I speak, look at this beautiful mural they've got on their building and it's really, appropriate and representative of our arts community downtown. So we're really proud that uh, the downtown partnership chose Pikes Peak Community College for one of their murals. And we should mention there'll be classes there this fall. There will be classes there this fall. So here's, here's our direction and the vision that I would like to lay out for, for where we go. Now I want to start with with this theme around anti-racist institution. And the very first thing I wanna do is I just wanna take on this word. And I know that the word racist is an incredibly emotionally charged word and for good reason. Um, it, you know, how it's been used to, to impact people over the years has created a, a deep emotional response to the word racist. When I talk about Pikes Peak Community College's commitment 
be an anti-racist institution. Fundamentally, we are talking about practices and policies that have a disproportionate negative impact on communities of color. And we want to change those. And so, so we know it can be done. We've seen in the data and the work from the Center for Urban Education and the Equity Project that we can make a difference in classroom by classroom, experience by experience. Data shows us, no surprise, that the students who speak up and have the greatest amount of engagement directly with their faculty member in a classroom, not surprisingly, are white males. And data also shows us that students of color speak up less in their classrooms and are less engaged and are called on less in their classrooms. And so finding ways to create an equitable experience, this is just one example of the kind of work that the Center for Urban Education has helped us take on and, and is now the equity project at Pikes Peak. Our goal remains equity and outcomes for students. When you see the 7% graduation rate for our African-American male students, that's not equity and outcomes. And so, so we've got work to do here. Our intent is to examine all of our practices and policies, looking for things that any practice, any policy that the college has that disproportionately negatively impacts students of color. We have great leadership for this project. Keith Barnes, our Chief Diversity Officer, and Dr. Regina Lewis, Special Assistant to myself, Special Assistant to the President, are working together to lead this initiative. And, and they're a tremendous resource to the college. I want to tell you, if, if you're experiencing challenges in your classroom or in your office environment around how to talk about race, and let's just acknowledge, I, I will acknowledge myself, as a white male, it's an uncomfortable topic. And in the past, it was a topic that I often just shied away from. I don't want to get myself in trouble. I'm just not going to say anything. I, I believe in equity for all, but I don't, I don't know the language. I don't feel comfortable talking about it. I've gotten better at it. One of the reasons I've gotten better at it is I've got Keith Barnes, Regina Lewis, and lots of other team members here at Pikes Peak that have helped me get better at it. But they have specifically studied the issue, they trained on the issue, they are compassionate, empathetic people. If you want to talk about race, I speak, I recommend those two folks to you. And they're going to provide us leadership. And I'm going to be right in the trenches with them and looking at our practices, looking at our policies, and trying to determine how they impact our institution, and in particular, our communities of color. So closing diversity gaps in hiring remains a huge challenge for us. We've made progress in some areas. APT in particular hires, we've made some progress in that we're proud of. But faculty hiring, hiring more diverse faculty members remains a tremendous challenge for us. And so this is really an effort focused at our systematic processes. We want to build a culture that is clearly intentionally welcoming of all people, both students, faculty, and staff, know that you are valued here equally and tremendously. That your, your input, whoever you are, is important to our college. It goes back to this theme of using our reserves and protecting our people and taking care of our people. Every person matters at Pikes Peak. And this isn't just about one race or one ethnic group. It is about success for all students Success for all students does clearly mean closing achievement gaps. I've been inspired by this book from Ibram Kendi. I had a chance to, to hear him talk and was really privileged to hear him talk at Colorado College last year. Recently read How to Be an Anti-Racist. I, I will uh, kudos to Lincoln Wolf, who probably a year ago came to the CBN meeting and brought this book and recommended it to me. I was too slow in getting to it, but Link and I appreciate that you put it on my radar. And it is an inspiring book, and it's really about systematic processes. And, and I just want to say that, that when we look at our systems, often whatever, whatever is in place, whatever our practice and policy is, it was, it's well intended. 
and it's there for a good reason. But no matter how well intended, if it has a negative, disproportionately negative impact on communities of color, then its policy is not serving our institution well, and that an anti-racist institution would revisit that policy and change that policy to make sure it does not have a disproportionately negative impact. We're going to have a kickoff with this uh, on September 22nd. We have a, a author and educator, Tim Wise, who has been working on this issue for many years and speaking for many years. You can see his videos out there on YouTube. He has been a passionate voice for equity in higher education in particular. We also have copies of the book. If you would like a copy of the book, please let me know. Uh, I'll get a copy of the book to you. The President's Office will pay for copies of this book for anyone who would like a copy of the book. I think it can really help us gain a common language and a less threatening language that, that we can talk with one another about race issues on our campus and how students are impacted by them. We have a project going on around this as well called the Empathy Project. And the Empathy Project really is one of those things that, that, that's at the intersection of what's going on with the pandemic and what's going on uh, across our nation with the civil rights movement and uh, in the effort to ensure that, that all people are treated fairly and equitably in interactions with uh, police officers. So, so, of course, police interaction with communities of color have really sparked a lot of anger and a lot of outrage and a lot of protests. But what do we do about it? How, how do we take this, this and move in a positive direction? Well, one of the things that, that, that we note at Pikes Peak is that we train a lot of the police officers who are out on the streets across our region. And, and I think we can do more around helping those officers experience and understand what it's like to be a person of color, for example, in a late night traffic stop and feeling a sense of fear and, and trepidation about what's going to happen. So the virtual, so, so this empathy development project is built around virtual reality technology. And our goal is to be able to create an incredibly immersive experience that puts every person going through our law enforcement academy, gives them the opportunity to stand in the shoes of a person of color and an interaction with a police officer and see what it feels like. And so, so I have uh, a limited but some experience with virtual reality and it is, it is a powerful technology. It really puts you into the, another person's body and to another person's eyes seeing the world. And we hope that it can be one of the things that helps us train police officers to be more competent and, and more effective in their work with communities of color in Pikes Peak region and beyond. Lance, a quick correction. Um, we had September 22nd, and it's actually September 29th for that uh, video conference that's coming up. Uh, thank you. I'm just going to switch back here. September 29th is the correct date, uh, corrected from 22nd. Um, we, I, I forgot one of the reasons that we're doing that is that the Community College System Office is also kicking off a big event on September the 25th. And so it's going to give us a chance to ensure we're fully aligned with what the uh, what Chancellor Garcia is doing at the system office around the similar initiative system wide. And uh, you might have picked up. I have a, an editor and support person here. Warren uh, Epstein is is here with me and uh, making sure we stay on track. Thank you, Warren. Instruction plans for fall. Uh, most of you have heard a lot about this, but there remain a lot of questions. So the way that we are delivering instruction, live video classes. So we're, it's been referred to sometimes as Zoom classes, uh, real-time remote live video classes. 25% of our, our lecture classes, we're asking that they be done live. And again, students wanted to be on campus and students genuinely want connection with their faculty members. And so right now, these live video classes, we think, are, are the best option. Traditional online goes on as it has. In-person classes for some things, so some career and tech ed classes, 
will be in person because they have to be to, to do the learning and do the work. Some of our science lab classes will also be in person and some of our studio classes can be in person. So some of our art classes, for example. And then finally, we're going to pilot a couple of dozen HyFlex classes and HyFlex is bringing new technology into the classroom. We didn't want to go in too far with this because we think there's going to be challenges, but we also think we can work through these challenges and, and HyFlex may really represent the future of higher ed and how we work at a, a bigger level. The odd thing about HyFlex is it's a little bit sort of back to the future and HyFlex is an instructor is in front of a live class. Simultaneously, that live class is being broadcast to people who are remote and then it's also being recorded so people can watch the class asynchronously. So many of you know, my father was a community college math faculty member for his whole career. And back in the 80s, I can remember my father teaching classes where he had a live class in person and then his class was being broadcast to another classroom somewhere else where people were doing what we call then distance education. What's different today is there's a live class and then other people are probably mostly at home on their computers, not gathered together in another classroom. I can imagine this being something that, that is part of higher education for many years to come because of the convenience to students. They can come to campus, they can watch at home online live, or they can pick it up asynchronously. I think that level of freedom concerns me for students a little bit. Sometimes when we give too much freedom uh, and not enough structure, it doesn't help students. But for some students, this is going to be really helpful. So I'm looking forward to this pilot and seeing how it works for us. Our capital projects are just on hold. And so, so in particular, fall last year, I talked about the, the CHES phase two, the, the medical campus phase two would be going on. We put that on hold. We had an, a planned student vote for a new CTE building here at the Centennial campus. And it would have been paid for with a student fee that would cover a bond. We postponed that vote and put that on hold because students were off campus and not informed. It wasn't the right time to do the vote, and it certainly was not the right time to, to increase the cost of going to college. So we, these projects will remain on hold until we're through this crisis. And again, priority one is to take care of our people and take care of you and make sure that we keep our team together. Once we know that we're past this and, and that the, uh, revenues are stabilized, then we'll go back to these projects and make decisions about moving forward. ITSS has uh, installed the HyFlex in six Centennial classrooms, eight Grand Park classrooms, one downtown classroom. In addition, we are also installing HyFlex technology in all of our large conference rooms. So A140, C200, those types of spaces are also being equipped with HyFlex to support not only classes, but also meetings and, and gatherings, for example, uh, diversity, equity and inclusion will be doing uh, gatherings of people to talk about equity issues on campus using high flex technology in those rooms. Uh, some of our protocols, we've, uh, we've worked hard at this. I want to acknowledge they've changed over time. And so if you're feeling like, well, it's hard to keep up, it is hard to keep up and, and they've changed and we, we have striven, strived all along to, to maintain alignment with the CDC, state public health, and local public health. They, they, those have been our guiding lights on this. Currently, we have a governor mandate on uh, masks in state buildings, and we are in state buildings at community, at Pike State Community College. You must wear a mask in our buildings and on our campuses. Uh, if you, unless you're in a, a office, closed door office situation. Otherwise, if you're out in the hallways and most importantly in the classrooms, masks will be required. We have made, um, we put into place processes to deal with, with exceptions to this. So uh, if you're concerned about wearing a mask on campus and you have a medical issue around that, if you're an employee that goes to HR, 
if you are a student that needs to go to student life and, and in particular, uh, I'm sorry, to, to accessibility services. Maria may say in accessibility services. And so we have process in place to deal with with exceptions, but, but we're not expecting a lot of those. We're expecting people to, to wear masks as mandated by the government. Social distancing is mandatory, and we put up a lot of signage on campus reminding people of this. For example, all the benches in the hallway have a notice on them that, that uh, capacity is one person on those benches. If you have symptoms, stay home, simple as that. Whether you're faculty, staff, or students, do not come to campus if you're experiencing symptoms of illness. And uh, finally, reporting is really important for helping keep others safe. So, so if we have a suspected case on campus, it's really important that we get a report of this. We have a responsibility to, to track these on our campus. We're not public health professionals, but we do need to get the word out to people if there's a case. So I put out a notice last week around our, our weather reporting language that we'll use, uh, COVID watch, COVID warning, and sorry, COVID alert outbreak. So COVID watch is we've got some verbal reports of possible positives or people with symptoms, but we haven't confirmed those. We'll let people know so that they can take the steps that they need to to protect, protect themselves, their colleagues, and their loved ones at home. All of this just goes to underscore over and over how important it is to follow the protocols, the health, pro the health department protocols on campus. Wearing a mask, hand washing, social distancing can protect us even when there are positives on campus. So hygiene protocols, a uh, big shout out to our physical plant, uh, Clint Garcia and his team. They've acquired technology that allows them to use this, this fogger system to go in and sanitize high touch areas twice a day. We've put in plexiglass shields and, and to see some of this technology and these changes, if you'd like to, we put out a video last week and we'll send the link out after this talk to take a look at what those look like. So you'll know some of the work being done, to make sure that we keep people safe on campus. We do have upgrades going on, even though our big capital projects are on hold. And what I want you to know about these upgrades primarily is we are not spending Pikes Peak Community College dollars on these. These are all dollars that were allocated through control maintenance processes or insurance dollars that, that uh, came to us for damage to the campus, in particular from the hailstorm in 2018 we're still recovering from. So roofing is, is ongoing. Electrical upgrades, um, we got almost a million dollars to do electrical upgrades at the Centennial Campus. A couple of years ago, we were in really rough shape here with our electrical system. Fire sprinkler project downtown is underway and should be completed shortly. The walkway project, a very large, expensive project, will be rebuilding the exterior courtyard elevated walkways at the Centennial Campus. And uh, that's about to go out to bid. It's going to be a bit disruptive, but this may be a good time with many fewer classes on campus. We'll be getting this done. We have a really great project to upgrade the, the restrooms. Again, this is control maintenance dollars coming from the state. The restrooms in uh, Aspen building, which are pretty rough shape, uh, will be expanded and upgraded, and they're, they're going to be really nice. This is this is a much needed and overdue upgrade for our students and folks that work in the Aspen building. And finally, the gym project will be redoing the floor in the gymnasium, and we're going to try to have all that done before the upcoming elections. Um, uh, in the past, we've used the gym as a polling site. New and future programs coming to Pikes Peak. I know we're, we're um, getting a little bit short on time, so I'm just going to go through search tech is entering its first full year, sort of uh, really getting getting its momentum. And uh, David Provost just done a great job of leading that program. Hospitality is kicking off in earnest this fall. Uh, emergency management and planning, we already have a four-year program in that for people coming out of fire and law enforcement academy and other areas. Now we'll have a specific two-year program in front of the four-year program. 
secure coating, vet tech, physical therapy assistant, and industrial maintenance. So a lot of new programs coming to Pikes Peak, and these new programs will help us stay relevant, responding to community demand, and will also really help us with enrollment at Pikes Peak. We've got a new marketing campaign that's out, and uh, most of these marketing campaigns we're doing are digital campaigns, and they are very well targeted at our specific audience of people who may enroll at Pikes Peak. I really like the current uh, video marketing, uh, the, the current campaign, because I think it's a really authentic voice. And I recognize these authentic voices of potential students talking over text messaging, uh, over text messages about higher ed and about going to college. And they're really driving home the fact that we're open, we're really good at what we do, the remote instruction and the in-person when we're able to, and we're really affordable and flexible. And so I think that those are, are going to really help us with enrollment. And I think they already are. You know, we're seeing our enrollment numbers get better every day. We've got a mass campaign going on out there, telling people that they're required and, and trying to take a positive approach to this, but and also trying to relieve the pressure on people to do mask enforcement. I think the more we can tell people this is what, what we're doing and this is what compliance looks like, the less some conflict that we might be exposed to around us. The Dakota Promise program is going great in spite of all the challenges. You might remember that any student who graduated in the spring from a District 2 high school we're guaranteeing their tuition and fees are paid to come to Pikes Peak Community College. Uh, our goal was to increase the number of students coming from District 2 by 50%. That would be about 130 students. Right now, we're at about 109 students have registered, but we expect that there's going to be more. And so we're going to come very close to that goal. We may be slightly short, but we're going to come very close to that goal in spite of the challenges. And Huge shout out to, to Jackie Gators Jordan. She's really been at the forefront of, of leading this effort, as well as acknowledgement of the team from enrollment and the amount of effort that's gone into trying to stay connected to these students and help them find their way to college. We've got a big election coming up in November, and it's going to be a challenging time for our college as well as our nation. Incredibly polarized. Uh, America right now, folks are, are emotional and responding to the upcoming election with um, you know, a lot of challenging behavior. So, so here's what you need to know to, to stay in the right lane at the college. You cannot use college resources in any way, shape, form, or manner. Not, no, no email, no phone calls, you can't even use a college pencil to advocate for or against any cap candidate or ballot measure. We just cannot use our resources, and that does include your time. So if you're working on anything related to a candidate or a ballot measure, and you're using normal work time, you need to be on vacation for that time to go and do that. Um, also a reminder that Rampart and Centennial campuses are both polling places. We have both drop boxes as well as live polling going on on our campuses. And that introduces more rules as well around what can and can't be done within a certain distance. Um, electioneering cannot be done within a certain distance of polling places. We'll get more information out as we come up on the election. What we can do is we can provide information sessions where there's balanced information. And I've been proud in the past that Pikes Peak has been host to candidate debates. So as long as both sides or both candidates are represented and given equal opportunity, we can host information sessions and, and that's entirely appropriate for us to do at a higher ed institution. Assessment goes on at Pikes Peak in spite of the challenges. And uh, I wanna tell you I'm really proud and kudos to all of our deans for their work and support of assessment. This past spring, as we looked at the financial crisis that was headed our way, we knew we had to dramatically reduce our operating costs. And so most release time for faculty was eliminated. 
the one thing that the that our, that our deans really advocated for, and I was really grateful to them for this, was assessment coaches and assessment support. And so, so those do continue. We are continuing all our assessment coaches and Friday workshops are, are upcoming. We have a number of different workshops that will be going on here in PDW. And uh, what, what I recognize in, in the college's support of assessment is that it's truly helped us get better at instruction. This, this, the, the saying in assessment world is closing the loop, but it's taking the information that we've learned about what how students are doing and figuring out how to use that information to improve instruction and to identify gaps in learning that students have and plugging into those gaps. And what I see is an institution here at Pike Speak that has really embraced assessment as a way to improve learning for our students. And so thank you for that. Uh, overdue change. Adjunct instructors will no longer have pay deducted for sick leave. I know in some cases we've been doing this, in some cases we haven't. We're not, not good at this practice. We're gonna clean this up. So, so in the short run, the, the commitment is Adjunct leader, adjunct instructors will not be docked for a sick time out. This seems particularly important right now with the pandemic, and we sure don't want people feeling like they have to come to work even though they're sick because they, they might spread the disease. Also, new legislation was passed in the last legislative session. It goes into effect as of January 1st, and we've got some work to do still to see how that's going to play out but it will ensure that adjunct instructors also get sick leave. And again, I want to end on the, the note I started with, the, the, the college across all departments and across every, every aspect of what we do in support of our mission. It's just done an incredible job. And I am so deeply grateful on behalf of our students, on behalf of colleagues, for the, the incredible, and, and, and I don't think it's exaggerating to say heroic work that has gone into maintaining the level of student success we have and maintaining the mission of our college. So thank you very much. And I'm gonna turn to my assistant and see if we have questions or time for questions. We certainly have time. And I really wanna encourage everybody to uh, go on. You can comment in the chat or raise a question in the chat or in the Q&A section. Uh, one clarification, uh, the, the Dakota Promise Scholars uh, who got the computers were only those that qualified for uh, Pell Grants, receiving computers. Um, one question we had earlier was, how are our enrollment figures tracking with our fellow colleges across the state? And uh, I know that, Lance, do you want to weigh in about it? It's, it we're right in the middle of the pack with the urbans, it well, looks like. We Compared to the, the system average, last week we were down about 2% more than the system average. And again, I think that the, the driving force behind while we're slightly behind is the number of military veteran students. And uh, that population right now is down about 50% compared to previous years. So nationwide community colleges though are also really down enrollment and higher ed is in down in general. So what we're seeing from most higher ed institutions in Colorado, from CU, CSU to, to uh, community college system, is we're all down in enrollment for the fall. Right. That's true. We end up pretty much in the middle of the pack with the ur other urban schools. Um, here's an interesting question from Tobias Brace. How is HyFlex different than WebEx integration to D2L? HyFlex is, is different, uh, if I understand the question right, in that the faculty member presenting will be live in front of a classroom with students in the classroom live, while simultaneously people can also check into that classroom remotely and be live remote. So live remote and live in person are happening simultaneously with a HyFlex class. Right. I, I think that's a, an accurate um, description of that. And his other question is, is it okay for him to be doing that integration? Absolutely. 
Absolutely. The more we're getting these live videos, I mean, that's one of the things that the data really pointed us in the right direction in spring. You want to talk about that, Lynn? Well, I, I think what I really want to talk about is the supporting innovation. And so yeah. if, if, if you as a faculty member have some different ideas and some thoughts about how you'd like to deliver your classes or how you'd like to support students, we want to be in a position of, of supporting that innovation. So we do have CARES Act funds that can be directed to that because your innovations around how you support students and learning like speak are being driven by COVID. And I think we can make that case. And as long as we can make that case, we could use CARES Act dollars. So if you have ideas, uh, help us um, with, with hearing about them and we'll support you. Uh, a question about the anti-racism event coming up on the 29th. Um, is that open for staff only or can we have students join in? I believe that this, this is going to be broadly available to faculty, staff, and students. And I will ask for help from uh, Regina uh, Lewis, who is our primary organizer, I think, with this, to, to get more information out to the whole college within the next week or so. And Karen has a good point of if, if anybody needs any more resources about High Flex or any of this, the technical end stuff, it, it is in the CEDL Lib Guide and the Remote Instruction Workshop is going to be available to help support instructors. Good idea. Uh, more questions out there? Uh, there was a shout out to Enrollment Services and what an amazing job our, our recruitment team has been doing in the midst of not being able to go where they usually go. They, they sure have. They have really stepped up. They've innovated. They've been the, the amount of contact that they have generated with the students has been just unbelievable, far more than we've ever done in a previous year. So, so overcoming challenges and innovating and figuring out how to work from home and still be successful for our students. So thank you. And April Frost has a big shout out to the CEDL team as well for organizing both this week and just basically supporting our faculty. Absolutely, CEDL team just Tremendous work making it all happen. We've never had to do PDW virtually, and they stepped up and figured it out. So, uh, not a question, but a good input from Laura Benamots. Um, in improving my responsiveness and effectiveness with students related to our goal to help being an anti-racist institution, two things have really helped. One is a critical look at the course content. How, how is that pushing a, a really strong anti-racist uh, intent? And also be a good listener. Avoid def def being defensive if a student expresses concerns. I, I think those are good tips, and it's, I, I appreciate the discussion going forward about that. I agree. And, and on the first point in particular, I, I think being aware of what do the images you show, for example, in a classroom look like? If you're doing PowerPoints, do the images you show reflect the diversity of our institution? And, and if not, can you do something about that? Um, we have a question of how to get a copy of Kendi's book. And I believe they could just email you, right? I, I have, uh, for, for lack of Anything else? I put myself out there. If you email me, I'll work to get. I'll get you a book. And uh, if we need to order additional copies, that would be a problem. I'd love to have. So yes, please let me know, and uh, we'll get a book to you quickly. And from Amy Reed, we have a thank you to Dr. Bolton and our leadership team for looking out for us and providing a steady leadership and direction. Thank you, Amy. For a tough time. Um, here's a question. You mentioned perspective and empathy, and one of the solutions is training the police, and that is wonderful. However, one of the great ways to teach perspective and empathy is through literature, and yet our literature department is struggling to fill classes. I really like to see more effort to steer students, students toward these classes with an emphasis on building more understanding of different cultures, perspectives, and experiences. Well, I don't disagree. R reading books, um, gives you a, a, a view into the life of somebody else in some other place in some other time. 
And, and I think literature is an incredibly important part of how we teach empathy and, and broad based views of the world. And that works. And also um, things like virtual reality that bring new technology to the experience can be really engaging for students. So I think the answer is both. I think we're at 1030. Warren, and yes, we, we, were, we were scheduled for an hour and a half. Um, so. And I want folks to know we are recording this. We will be posting this on the president's page. And I want to thank everybody for coming. With over 350 participants through most of this, this is probably the most attended PW talk ever. <laughs> thank you all. Thanks, everybody. Thank you everybody for coming and we're going to end our event today and um, check out the CETL Lib Guide in the um, PDW material to sign up for other workshops that are coming on this week and have a great week.